We have to get through our own things that are keeping us stuck in life so that we can be present to hear our children, to be there for them. When you get curious for yourself, then you can be open to maybe hearing some things and just don't feel like you know the whole story. We're just worthy for being who we are. That is just a fact. You just already are. Jealousy is actually the solution, not the problem. Hey everyone, welcome to Flow Over Fear. Thank you so much for being here today. Today we're going to have a conversation about uh, uh, jealousy and, and a lot of things that are associated with that, self-worth and, and, and how we feel in those ways. Really uncomfortable feelings for us, but something we feel a lot. But the good news is, is that there are tools and things that we can do to help us rise above it and heal from those things. And today I'm talking to my guest, Shannon Bryant, who is passionate about her advocacy for building self-worth and navigating relationship hurdles. She's an entrepreneur, a podcast host, a, dy a dynamic speaker, and she's the creator of the Top Self Podcast, where she engages in candid discussions about topics like insecurity, jealousy, and self-belief. Her extensive experience in learning and development spans over a decade, involving the facilitation of over 400 personal development classes to empower individuals to rewrite their narratives and break up with the limiting beliefs that they hold. Shannon's self-regulation recipe helps people enhance self-awareness and make positive behavior changes. And who doesn't need that, right? Welcome, Shannon. That's Good right. to see you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Adam. I'm super excited for our conversation. Me too. This is a, I mean, this is a topic that's near and dear to all of us. Like for instance, I am super jealous that you wore the same thing as I did today and you look, <laughs> and it just, you, you wear it better than I do for sure. So <laughs> who wore it best, right? We're side by right. side. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm, no kidding though. I was like, like right before this, I, I, I was like feeling a little cold. I'm like, I better put on a sweater. So of course, yeah, I put on something on and, and yeah, we were, we were like in the same mindset, same zone. So we are awesome. in sync. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I I, I want to start. I want to get into your story a little bit and hear a little bit about you. What what got you into this work? Where what's uh um you know what's your background? I like to hear the origin story of my guests before we jump sure. into the topic. Yeah, I mean, if you would have told me eight years ago that I'd be helping other people overcome jealousy, I would have said, there's no way, no way I could do that. One, because I suffered from it myself for decades. Um, and I just thought that that's how I am. I thought it was part of my DNA and the way that I was made. And two, I thought I was the only one. I didn't know that other people felt this way, had these types of thoughts, had problems in their relationships because of it, the way that I was. And so I just thought this is who I am and this is how it's always going to be. So of course, that led to um, some counseling because my I grew up in a very chaotic environment. My father was an alcoholic and as you can imagine, that definitely leads to some insecurities and some low feelings of self-worth. He, my parents got divorced when I was about 12 and I didn't have a relationship with him after that. I didn't speak to him again until he was, or until I was 25. And then that was just briefly until three years ago, which happened to be the last three years of his life, we were able to rekindle and build this beautiful relationship the last three years. But wasn't always that way. And so I grew up with this belief that, well, gosh, if my own dad doesn't love me, who, no one else is going to love me. Who else would love me? And so I just really felt like I wasn't worthy of anyone's love. If of anyone staying with me, I had that fear of abandonment with most of my relationships. So I stayed in some relationships that were bad, you know, stayed way too long because I was insecure. And then I ruin some with some potentially fine people because of my jealousy. And so um, I, I sought therapy. And one of the things as my husband and I actually got kicked out of therapy and I'm happy to go into that story later, but, <laughs> oh, yeah, but we as, I go there. Leaving, yeah, <laughs> as I was leaving, she handed me what is called the ACA laundry list. I you're probably aware of it, the adult children of alcoholics laundry list. And it's this, you know, 14 characteristics 
of an adult who grew up in that environment. And when I saw it, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, check, 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 check. I have all, you know, yep, that's me. That's me. That's me. So when I saw it, I realized, okay, if there's a list, that means somebody else has felt this way. I didn't write it. So somebody else has felt this way. And if there's a list, that means there must be a solution. And so I started to really dive into my jealousy. Why do I feel this way? Why am I so insecure? And after many years of of uh, research and and practicing different things to see what works and really doing some personal development, I wanted to do it for other people so that they wouldn't be suffering as long as I did. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm very familiar with that adult children of alcoholics uh, 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 book and and workbook and and the and the list. I was you know when I was when I got sober about 12 years ago, I was introduced to it and by my therapist. And she told me to look over and I'm like, but I'm the alcoholic. I don't, I'm not a child of an alcoholic, but it's, it's amazing how you can look at how that, how those behaviors come into play or how those, 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 you know, internal things, those, that, that lack of self-worth and all that kind of stuff comes from these learned behaviors. And I'm, and I wonder, you know, a, a lot of us try, we were talking offline about, you know, we're both parents and, uh, we were, and you know, I always think like, how can I be the best parent for my kid? How can I show up? But it feels like regardless of how well we do a lot of times, even, you know, um, that that there's things that our kids might pick up that just, you know, are things they need to heal from later. In your case, obviously, your dad was an alcoholic and that and and you left, you didn't talk to him. In my case, my parents were great. You know, I love my parents, but there's still like the, those elements of like, man, now, I, but I've still got this anxiety and all this kind of stuff. How do we, how should we approach, I mean, I, maybe we're jumping way ahead, but as parents, how should we approach that for our kids in terms of helping them have the tools to maybe bring some of those insecurities to light and overcome them early? Yeah. Well, I think you're right. I mean, definitely sometimes it's generational, right? My dad was an alcoholic because his father was an alcoholic and that stuff sometimes just kind of goes down the line. I think there are other pieces where we may have a child who maybe they're bullied at school and that brings on some anxiety for them. So I think one, we have to get through our own things that are keeping us stuck in life so that we can be present to hear our children, to be there for them. And I think that's one of the biggest things. We may miss that sometimes because we are so wrapped up in in our own, maybe a lot of times what's going on with us and our own struggles. It's really hard for us to be present. It's hard for us to be present anyway, um, you know, on a normal basis, because we've got cell phones and we've got busy lives and we've got work and, you know, aspirations that we want to try to accomplish. And so to me, though, it's getting really to the point where we're being present in our own lives so that we can hear and have those conversations with our children um, to see what's going on. And also, you know, to your point that your parents were great, we can't always assume that just because, you know, us as parents, we don't have some of these issues. Maybe you're not a drug abuser or you're not an alcoholic or you're not having, you know, affairs on your, your, you know, in your marriage. It doesn't mean that there aren't other things that could be happening with your child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and I guess it feels like it's a careful balance, too, with your kids where where they, you know, are are absorbing everything from the world around them. And we're still human as parents. So we can't like, you know, be the perfect uh, representations for that. So maybe a little grace on ourselves sometimes that that if if we're trying to actually do our best and a willingness to learn. Um, yeah, it I, I I'd love to dig a little deeper on that, on, you know, how, uh, how that relationship with your dad kind of developed, how, what was that process? Uh, I mean, so you, you were estranged from him till you were 25 years old. Um, what, what, what was the, I guess, what was the, the catalyst to that, that gap that you had that, that, yeah. that time period? So when my parents separated, um, you know, my parents fought all the time. It was one of those where it, 
is he going to come home drunk? Is he not going to come home at all? Are we going to have to go pick him up? What's going to happen? You know, sometimes you want him to come home and sometimes you're like, please do not because <laughs> we don't know. And so that obviously created arguments all the time. And then it really, you know, the last straw, um, my dad actually pulled a gun on my mom when our us kids were home. And so he was chasing her at, um, through the house with it and out of the house. And so that was the final straw. They got a divorce, thankfully. And he went to, you know, AA and said, I'm going to go get help. I'm going to get better. You know, I want my family back. And so we were thinking he was, you know, in recovery, which he was for a time. And as you know, it's so difficult. And so he, you know, he fell off and he came to pick up me and my little brother and he had a beer in his lap. And I was like, no, you know, as long as you're drinking, I was 12. So I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. But I said, as long as you're drinking, I don't want to have anything to do with you. And he took that to heart. And I didn't talk to him again until I was 25. And my mom continuously encouraged me to try to have a relationship with him. And I just felt like I don't need him, you know, at this point in my life, I've, I've grown up, I've done all of the things that, you know, you want a dad there for, you think you want a dad there for. So what do I need him for now? So I was really resistant to creating, you know, trying to go back and create this relationship. And I felt like, and I'm the child, like you're the parent, you should be reaching out to me. But I finally, as I started to overcome my own things with my, with my own jealousy, you know, one of the things that I teach my clients and one of the things I really used when I was trying to overcome my jealousy was the power of one, being open to a new explanation or a new evidence or new example. And so I would try all those different things. And I thought, okay, it's working with the jealousy thing. Like maybe he didn't really stare at that girl or maybe he was, he was just looking for the, where the restroom was. So maybe it will work in this situation. So I thought I need to give this a try. There's probably stuff that I don't know with the relationship with my dad. Um, so let me be open and let me explore. And, and so that's what I did. I, it didn't go well in the beginning because I was still wanting this apology, you know, huge apology from him. And really trying to get him to understand how hard my life has been because of it. And, you know, no one wants to be told how how miserable you made them. So it didn't go over very well. And I had to get to the point where, again, being open to like, well, maybe I don't need the apology. Like, what if I don't need the apology? Is there something still there? And I knew we were never going to have the normal father-daughter relationship, but what can we have? And so that's how it started. And we built a beautiful relationship and I learned so much and it, things made so much more sense. Did, you know, did the things he do, did it still make them wrong? Yes. But was there more grace there for sure? And so, um, he just passed away this, not September, but the September before. And I'm so thankful that I was able to have that relationship with him and learn through that. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. And I, I wanna I wanna get into a discussion on that forgiveness and how to forgive beyond that. Um and before I do, I I, I was struck by the the courage that you had as a 12 year old to set those boundaries on your dad, you know, and and you know, just even putting yourself even putting myself in a in a in a position of being a 12 year old, trying to have that with an authority figure who at one time I saw chase around my mom with a gun. You know, just that amount of courage was, it's incredible. And, and to contrast that too, I, I, I think it's, I think there's something important that people might read into that, or at least I'm reading into it too, that it doesn't, even, even if we practice a courageous moment, it doesn't necessarily end there because that led to these years of estrangement, challenge, self-worth, you know, and all that kind of stuff that, that sometimes we still have to do the work even beyond that. Does that kind of resonate yeah. with what you're talking oh, about? Yeah. 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 And it it is like that layer. You just kind of keep peeling back. And and you know, it's I'm sure you have experienced this too in terms of progress or in any time there's 
growth happening, it's not going to just happen, you know, like, oh, I just have this huge um, growth spurt. And now I just keep coming up from there. It's usually this windy turning up and down like, oh, you know, that didn't go well. Okay, let me try this. Oh, that really fell flat. Let me let me see if I can do it a different way. So I think, you know, really having that tenacity and keeping going, um, but also allowing yourself like I did have to take a little bit of a break. There were times where I go, okay, you know, I just don't feel like I can talk to him this week because I just don't have it in me or, you know, for the next couple of weeks. So you just have to do your own pace, but yeah, you'll get yeah. there. And that's, that feels so, so true. I mean, just like, there's never, it's not like a Hollywood ending to a movie where it's like everything works out. You get the, you get the, 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 um, you know, the special someone, everybody, you know, everybody's happy. It's always a happy ending. I mean, yes, things can be happier, but, um, but there's always a challenge beyond a breakthrough, which is fine because that's where growth occurs. I think that that there's some power in that. Um, um, so kind of talking about that forgiveness piece, that's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, people who may be dealing with a lot of that kind of stuff where they don't feel they, they can't see a path to forgiveness. And certainly you're in your situation with your father, there's, it's hard to envision that there would be a path to forgiveness with that. How did that un, unravel and how, or how did that unwrap itself? Or how did you un, unwrap that? I mean, probably with tons of therapy, but it's, I'd, I'd love to hear what guidance you might have for people who might be looking for that forgiveness or maybe helping mm -hmm. themselves through it. Yeah. I think sometimes, you know, in some people's situation, the initial thought is there is no forgiveness for that. Like there just are some things that they may think there is no forgiveness for that. And that's okay if that's where they are, you know, and I think one, it is definitely going at your own pace, but two, just being open. Cause most of the time we think, I know the whole story. I know what the story is. I know what he did. I was there. I saw what happened. This is how this person ruined my life. This is how, you know, this affected me, but just being open to maybe I don't know the whole story. And so going from instead of judgment, going in with curiosity. And to me, getting really curious, like, okay, I'm not doing this for you or to make you feel better or to have some grandiose relationship that I think, you know, that I wish that we had. But I'm just curious about some things and I'm curious for myself. And I think when you get curious for yourself, then you can be open to maybe hearing some things. And, and, you know, my biggest thing is to just don't feel like, you know, the whole story. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I would be curious to know what the, and I, I, then that's why I like the word curious there because a uh, curious versus judgmental, one of my favorite Ted Lasso quotes, by the way. <laughs> and, and yeah, but um, I, am I, um, you know, I think that the idea of curious curiosity, curiosity seems to be an antidote to so many different things. I mean, yeah, in, um, certainly ignorance, um, certainly like, um, you know, uh, uh, fear, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, curiosity can be a, an antidote to a lot of things. Where did that curiosity lead you with your father? Did it, uh, did it open a, a, a door to, to like, understanding where he was coming from? Did it build understanding or did it, was it just like, this is who you are. This is who I am. Now we can move beyond it. How did, how did you, yeah. what was that path for you? I would say it was a pretty good mix of it. Yes. There were mm -hmm. some things like I didn't understand, you know, I knew my parents were married early and I knew that they had my older brother very early on, but not thinking about the pressure on my dad back then to here he is 18 years old, you know, met my mom when he was 17, 18 years old. And now he has a child that he has to take care of and a wife that he has to take care of and, and, you know, work for. And so just taking a moment to, to really realize what it was like maybe for him to be in those shoes of thinking, oh my gosh, I'm 18 years old. I have this huge responsibility and these people to take care of. Did he go about it the wrong way? Certainly. But 
a lot of us, you know, we try this, like, uh, how do I deal with it? And it was a lot for him to take on. Plus having a father who was an alcoholic, that's what he saw. So just, there was definitely some understanding, but also I had to get to a place where I have to get rid of this fantasy. You know, sometimes we get into like you were talking about, you know, the the movie ending and, you know, this storybook ending. And as long as we're stuck there thinking that that's how it should be and that that's the only way that it's going to be great, then we do we get stuck in that place. And so, again, kind of going back to being open about that is let me just see what else it could look like it could look like something else that's really, really great. And knowing that, no, it may not be the exact relationship that you wanted or turn out the exact way, but it can be really great. (laughs) So I think it was a combination of both those things. Yeah. How, um, how does, you know, you mentioned the self-worth was something that that's affected. And a lot of times the, the, in, in those early, early days, especially when you have abandonment issues or, or things like that, how does that relate to jealousy, mm. like our feelings mm. of jealousy? Yeah. A lot of it comes from not trusting in yourself. So mm. when you don't feel worthy, then you're, you're, you know, you're feeling like, I don't even trust myself. I don't like myself in these moments. So why would someone else? I don't feel like I belong here. You know, when I was growing up, um, no matter what room I was in, it would not matter. But I always felt like I'm the, the dumbest, ugliest, poorest, you know, it, it just didn't matter all the negative, anything negative that you would have maybe in your mind, I felt like I was the worst of all of them. And when you don't have that supportive environment growing up to share, to show you, like you are worthy, you are worth these things. I think we tend to feel like it's what we've accomplished or what we can accomplish, but we're just worthy for being who we are. That is just a fact. You just already are. I think we place too much on the things that we do, the way that we look, um, the accomplishments, that then that's how we judge that worthiness. And so there's a really... um, there's a learning curve there, I think, in terms of what does make me worthy. Yeah. And I know that there's an element of what we see is not always a true picture of, of what we get. Like, and the comparison is the thief of joy in a lot of these cases. If we're looking at an Instagram of somebody that's showing all of their good qualities after like all the makeups on, all the filters going, you know, all like I'm in the best place in the world, but that's just one specific instance that was framed for that moment and you're not seeing the rest of it. Is is that what's leading to it or is it deeper than is that what's leading to our jealousy or is that is it deeper than that? It's definite it's deeper, but that mm-hmm. sh- certainly doesn't help, right? Right. <laughs> um, yeah, it certainly doesn't help. We are absolutely in that comparison mode. We aren't supposed to see, you know, I heard someone say, we're not supposed to see all of that. You know, we're not supposed to be able to see what everyone in the world or anyone at any point in the world before it was like, I knew, you know, my schoolmates and that's what you compared yourself to, but now it's the whole world. Right. And so, um, that makes it difficult it, but it is deeper than that. And, um, that is how it leads into that jealousy. You know, I, I said the story, that story that I told myself that if my own dad doesn't love me, no one else will love me. I carry that, which then made me unlovable, which means, well, no one's going to stay. And Mm then, well, I'm not going to choose someone who is great and fantastic because I'm drawing that, right? I, I don't feel good about myself. And when I have a, when I have a relationship with somebody who's not treating me great, that just reinforces. Yep. That's pretty much what I expected. That's pretty much what, how it should go. That's what I deserve. And then you start seeing these signs of, okay, well now there's some infidelity. This person cheated on me in that relationship. Now I'm in a new relationship. That person cheated on me in the relationship. 
So our amygdala in our brain is going, yep, I've taken note of this. And if anything looks similar, I'm going to show, I'm going to treat that as a threat. And then we get in this pattern and this habit as we go through the years and in relationships where it's constantly firing, like that's a threat, that's a threat, that's a threat, that's a threat. And then we're looped into now I'm checking his phone and checking the email and checking social media and constantly in anxiety over it. Hey, everyone, I interrupt this program to introduce you to a powerful tool that will help you gain clarity on your vision and accelerate your growth and achievement. If you're listening to this show, it is likely that you have an exciting vision for your life. But the problem is, is that we often get caught up in the day to day. We get distracted. We face uncertainty, overwhelm and self doubt. And as a result, the gap between where you are and where you want to be seems insurmountable. And that's why I created a framework for how you can turn your vision into strategic, disciplined action that will accelerate your results in the next 90 days. I call it the Vision Reflection Retreat. It is a two-day solo excursion designed to reignite passion and adventure into your busy life and realign your focus toward your why. This is the very same framework that I use every 90 days to reflect on my own life and my vision and set my goals for the next quarter. And it has been a game changer. And the good news is, is that I'm giving away this Vision Reflection Retreat Guidebook for free when you sign up for my newsletter. Simply go to flowoverfear.com slash retreat and download your free guide and enjoy the journey. Yeah, so we're going through life just thinking that everything's a threat because it's hitting hitting ourselves the way that that in in just some way that our brains are conditioned to believe and that may not be true um that's crazy yeah so i, I want to ask a, this question because I, I i i my flavor of choice of uh was always shame <laughs> I, their shame shame was always my flavor when i was in in the midst of like my uh my big challenges alcoholism all that stuff um i felt a lot of shame and, and i asked myself as i was recovering and i wanted to see if there was there was every productive reason for shame to exist. And I couldn't think of, of one. And I, I, I'm curious about that with regard to jealousy. Is there a productive purpose for jealousy? Yes. So, you know, one of the things that I always say that's a little bit controversial, and I heard it, there's not too many people that talk about jealousy. And so I've done a lot of research and, and saw, but um it is jealousy is actually the solution, not the problem. So we walk around saying, I'm so jealous. I'm ruining my relationship. I have such a problem with jealousy. No, jealousy is the solution. It is a solution. It is not the problem. It's there to say, Hey, something isn't right. Something is going on. Now, some people may take that as, which happens most of the time when we get ourselves in trouble of, Oh, I'm feeling jealous. That must mean they're doing something. They're doing, our partner is doing something wrong. Most of the time, if you have this extreme jealousy that I work with people on, it is, there's no evidence of infidelity, but it's that trigger going off again saying, Hey, this is a potential threat. It looks very similar. And so then, you know, that it's trying to say, Go look at what is wrong. What is the actual problem? This is trying to solve something for you. So in my case, I had to go back and go, okay, wait a second. I have been telling this story my whole entire life. And one of the beautiful things that came out of that relationship of, it isn't that my dad doesn't love me. He has a disease. He was trying his hardest. It had nothing to do with his love for me. And it absolutely certainly didn't have anything to do with my own worth. And so we don't go back a lot of times and kind of dump out that junk drawer of those beliefs because we just, it's not like we're constantly inventorying them. So that's one of the things I think I, and, and I work with people on is let's go inventory and see where that, like, what is, what's back there that's really holding you back. And so that's where jealousy definitely has its place in terms of like, go solve this because 
jealousy actually wasn't my biggest problem, right? It was right. deeper than that. It was just showing itself as a symptom that way. Interesting. So jealousy is a signal. So it's a signal that you that that there's just something you need to look at. I love that. And I love that philosophy because I I believe the same thing about fear or like, you know, our anxiety. It's just it's it's not it's not dangerous unless we're um, in the midst of like a bear or something like that. But we're, you know, it's just it's a signal that we need to look at something that, hey, you know, you're either pushing up against the edge of your comfort zone or there's something there, but just dig deeper. And I, I feel like that gets back to your previous point about just getting curious about it, asking the question, where is this? Because shedding light on it, shedding light on the monster doesn't feel, it doesn't feel as scary anymore. And you can start to get to the bottom of it and figure out what's the root cause. Um, are there any, uh, are, are there any common themes among the, the root causes of jealousy? Like, you say that 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 jealousy was not the issue for you. That was not the that was not the, but that it was just a signal. What is? Are there common themes around the 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 root causes of jealousy? Well, so most of the time, it is people who have grown up in you know they've had some type of chaotic or you know dysfunctional environment growing up, so they don't have that solid foundation, whatever, and it can look many different ways. But having some dysfunctional background is usually um, almost 90% of the people that I've talked to, that's an issue. Now, it can come up later on in life where somebody may have a relationship where there's infidelity or a series of relationships with infidelity, and then they will become jealous in their future relationships. And that's just naturally how the brain works, right? It tags those types of things and goes, hey, I don't want to do this again. I don't want us to go through this again. So again, going back to, you know, that part in your brain, the amygdala that's going, okay, I got it. I will be on the lookout and I'll be hyper vigilant for anything. And then it becomes this insecure habit that we get into. So then it's going back to like, okay, we got to break the habit and, and try to dig in and see, okay, is this something that is deeper that came from, um, you know, dysfunction potentially, or is it a series of relationships? But you were talking about shame earlier, and that one is such a huge one. And people don't talk about being jealous in their relationships. It's a very, we don't want to say it. We're certainly not putting our dating apps, you know, nobody wants to go, Hey, look at the, like, (laughs) get with me. I will drive you bonkers. No one's doing that. (laughs) It's not one of those things. And we're very embarrassed about, you know, the things that we've said to our partner, the way we react in situations. When somebody has extreme jealousy and and a situation happens, they are almost, they have a feeling of kind of being out of control of their own actions and their own emotions. And so they're really embarrassed and ashamed to admit those things. So getting them talking, which is part of why a lot of them that suffer from it they're not talking about it. Or if they talk about it to their friends and their friend goes, what he's never done anything or she's never done anything. Like nothing's even happened yet. Why are you worried about that? Most don't understand it if they're not going through it. And so then that causes more shame. Like, okay, I don't have anyone then to talk to. And so then it becomes where you just feel like you're by yourself. Yeah. So the, do, do you find that people that you work with um, are are at, are at a point where they're, they're just willing, like, I just can't get over this jealousy. I need to get over this. This is, or, or do they not even recognize it yet? Because, and the reason I ask is like for things like fear, it's like, you know, people don't want to admit they're afraid, but they, they just say, I oh, gosh, I mean, there's just, I don't know what to do about this. I'm so uncertain. And well, yeah, just get to the root of it. But like, do, do you find that's true? Like I, I, cause I imagine people listening might be thinking like, oh yeah, that, totally to a T that, that, that represents my spouse or this person I know, but it does never reflects individually. So (laughs) (laughs) how do people see that in themselves? Yeah, for sure. When it's this extreme jealousy like this, they know, they know. And I will say, you know, as hard as it is for their partner, um, they more than anyone would wish they were not like that. Like I will do anything to not be like this. They just don't know how. And it's one of those things where it takes, you know, a while and it's a process just like getting sober, just like anything where you're really 
having some personal growth and making some transformations, it takes a while, but they, they know. And, um, and their partner usually is pretty aware. Some can try to keep it hidden a little bit, but usually their partner is very aware, well aware too. Yeah. So I yeah. have two questions about that. When people have that extreme jealousy, uh, how, how do you, can you talk us through how, walk us through how you, um, how you help them? How do you start? How does someone start the process of healing through that? Yeah. Well, and I want to, I want to make the distinction too, that a tinge of jealousy is totally normal. It's fine to get a little jealous here and there. It is when you, when there are arguments that are happening because of your jealousy, when you are feeling like you have a constant upset stomach, you're anxious, you're, you know, you feel like your heart is always racing. You can't focus at work because it doesn't just affect the relationship. It doesn't just affect your home life. It also affects your career and your work. It's really hard to concentrate at work if you're constantly, you know, every 10 minutes looking up to see what your partner's doing or going through their social media. So when you are feeling those types of things, and then more importantly, when it starts to change your partner. So in my case, my husband, you know, thank, thankfully he stayed. Should he have? I, probably not. You know, probably shouldn't, but he did. And, but it, he, it started to change him too, where he felt like he couldn't look up, you know, even just walking or he couldn't look at a certain place in a restaurant. And it got to the point where we weren't going to dinners. We weren't going to movies. We weren't going to events. And so it really started to change him as well. So when it is that drastic, um, then yes, you got to go back to, okay, if jealousy is a solution, what is it trying to solve for me? And that's where that power of one O N E open to new, like dig in. Is it, you know, do you need to look at something different? Be open to a new explanation, new evidence, go into, well, we're, you know, thinking like, when's the first time that I felt this way? And just trying to go back, I do this really great exercise um, in my group coaching program where they do kind of this lifeline lifeline exercise. And so they'll start from their earliest memory, whether it was good or bad, and just kind of make a hash and then write what it was and about their age. And it's really interesting when they go back and they look at it and go, well, no wonder, like, oh, that happened. And then that happened. And then I did this thing, you know, and so then it all, all kind of starts to add up for them. But I will say also, it's really looking at three underlying factors. Like usually it's projection, protection, or competition. So projection can be, they had a past relationship where that person cheated on them. And so now they're projecting it onto their new partner or they themselves have cheated in their relationships or doing things like maybe you're a little too flirty with Sean in accounting. Maybe. Yeah. So I'm you projecting spot it, you it. got it, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm projecting it onto my partner. Yeah. Um and then of course the protection piece, which, you know, it's I'm I'm gonna protect myself from not feeling this way ever again. Mm -hmm. So we start to kind of try to figure out where they're fall where they fall in line. Yeah, I think that's so helpful to to frame it like that, where you're where you're looking at pro projection, protection, or competition. I, I feel like naming a lot of these things just take starts to take the power away from them a little bit, and you, then you start to build on the courage or confidence that you might need. Um, so that that's powerful. Um, so the second part of that question too would be, you know, it seems that there's not really w just one person involved in in the jealousy and the extreme jealousy, right? There's also the spouse, like you mentioned, your husband not being able to look up a lot of times. Um, how would someone that may be experiencing a partner who's jealous to that degree uh, start to respond to it? Or or is there anything that they could, could do to help with that? Yeah, this is one of those where, because <clears throat> what will happen is, and I'll just use my, me and my husband, for example, I would, we'd be in a situation, I'm jealous, I'm looking to him for reassurance. And then if he gives that to me, then, okay, you've just scratched my itch. That's going to help me for a little bit until I come back around and I need that hit of assurance again, 
or reassurance again. And so that just keeps us in that loop. And so as hard as it may be, it's kind of for the partner. Yes. Maybe trying to understand by asking questions, but them trying to give that reassurance. One, if they're really in a fit, it's probably not going to work. You know, you're getting the the cold shoulder or you're getting like the non-belief. Like, I don't trust you what you're saying. I don't trust that you didn't look at her. I don't trust where you were. I don't trust that that's what happened. And so that's where it comes, becomes really um, hard for the partner because they're telling the truth. They're giving that reassurance, but it still doesn't make it better or it only makes it better for short term. So I think for a partner, it's more like asking questions. Well, what's making you feel that way? What made that come up? Were you thinking something before that just happened? Because they're the jealous person is going to want to put that blame on their partner. If you didn't do this, I wouldn't feel this way. But that reassurance part where we just, you know, the partner just keeps trying to reassure, just keeps him in the loop and keeps everybody frustrated. Yeah, that seems a bit counterintuitive too, because you're, you're thinking like, oh, I'll just reassure, you know, tell her that everything's okay. Everything's, every, you know, you think that that's just like going to put a put an end to it, but it, apparently it doesn't. And, and again, that curiosity piece comes up, like just, just get asked questions. Um, it, it never, in my experience, it's never steered me wrong to actually get uh, <laughs> curious and show interest in my wife's feelings. So, <laughs> <laughs> ding, right? ding, ding, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe that's, that's the way to work it. Yes. Um, yeah. I, so what's, and like, so when we're, when somebody's working with, with, um, with jealousy or, 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 or any of these things, insecurity, or, you know, self-worth, self-belief is another big one. It's something that is one of the three real, uh, the three real primary root causes of fear that I believe it exists is this, is this lack of self-belief. Um, what's the end goal in trying to heal through that? Like, what, what are we trying to, uh, what is, what does success look like on that front? Mm-hmm. Well, when it comes to the jealousy piece, obviously, you know, again, using my example, when we couldn't go to dinners, we couldn't go to movies, it really became where not just we couldn't do it together, but now I'm missing out on stuff that I actually like to do. I just could, you know, was horrible in the, in the situation. So, you know, overall, if we look at it, we're never going to be able to say for sure, a hundred percent, if our partner is going to you know, we can't prove fidelity, right? Mm -hmm. So like, there's no proof of that. (laughs) And that's also what keeps us like, we look in their phone, we don't see something. So I'll say, oh, you know, I would say, well, he must be really good at hiding it, or I'm not looking at the right time, or I'm not, you know, it's somewhere else. So there's no proof of that fidelity. So what you're, the, the end goal really is, how do I get myself to where one, I'm physically healthy and I'm mentally healthy. And, uh, you know, physical health, that anxiety causes so many things. And when you're running with this jealousy and you're insecure and you're feeling that anxiety on a daily basis, it just wreaks havoc on your body. So yes, the jealousy thing we want to handle, but how can we get to even just where you can have some calm moments in your life? And that's where um, we, you know, we won't go into it too much here, but the self-regulation recipe comes into play. Like we need to get to where we can just kind of be calm. So working on our physical health and then the mental part and the relationship piece of it. And so people just want to be able to, you know, I want to enjoy a dinner with my husband or my wife and not, be filled with anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, we all, I mean, that's, those are the kinds of things we pick our spouses. We pick our, the partners that we want to be with because we enjoy spending time with them. We want to spend our time with them. Why spend that time being in, in such a, you know, terrifying place. I, I, I feel like that that's, that's a very uh, appealing end goal is just to be able to spend that time again with the person that you love or the person you like to spend that time with without those feelings. Um, I, I, if you're, if you're willing, um, I, I would like to get into that, uh, s- uh, that self-regulation recipe that you were talking about. Um, and just kind of, maybe if you could touch on it and, and yeah. tell us how that works. Yeah. 
So, um, you know, I've been talking a lot about the amygdala and the amygdala kind of triggers and says, Hey, there's a, you know, there's a, a snake and really, okay. After more consideration, I know that it's not a snake. It's a stick. Everything is good. But when we're in that and our amygdala is saying, yes, for sure, this happened. It's like, you can see that it's happening. You think that that's really what's going on. And so a lot of times, um, people who experience this extreme jealousy will say, I felt completely out of control in that situation. And so we have to do things when you're that out of control and you're that worked up and you're that anxious, you're cutting off that supply to your brain, that oxygen to your brain. So of course you're not going to think clearly. So we have to bring that down. So some people do it through box breathing. I always say breathing is the best thing because you'll always have your breath. You know, I don't need a yoga mat. I don't need a, you know, a, a room or a music, anything like that. I've got my breath anywhere that I am. I can just use my breath. I can just use my breath. Um, and then sometimes we may have to remove ourselves from that situation. We're not ignoring it. We're going to come back to it. But if staying in that situation is going to cause you to have actions that you're not going to be proud of, that you're going to be ashamed of, we need to maybe excuse ourselves to the restroom, take a break and come back to it. And then really outside of that sort of panic attack that you're having or that panic moment. Um, of course, we want to do exercise. We know you, know you hear it all the time. Exercise is great for that kind of stuff, but we don't do it um, or we don't think of it that way. Um, but exercise is great. And so and then practicing these tools and techniques. So if I just started to do box breathing, which is the technique that I use, but if I just start doing that in that moment when it comes up, but I haven't been practicing it outside of that, I'm not probably going to do it right. Like we all learned CPR at one point, but if I'm not, if I haven't done it since I learned it in school, I'm probably not going to do it right. And I'm probably not going to be, you know, do it very well. So it's about practicing outside of those moments as well. Right. Yeah. No, that's, that's really helpful. I think that, that if, if we could take that kind of advice, you know, it, it can help us to realign ourselves and maybe put us put us in a place that where we can where we could start to heal a little bit more. And um, if people want to learn more about that process and 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 work with you or or get in touch with you, um, a who who are you? Um, who is your ideal client? Who are you work, mm -hmm. looking to work with? What uh, um, what what does working with you look like? Yeah. So I. You, People can go to topself.com. They can reach me there. I have a few different ways. So I work with clients one-on-one -on -one, or I work with, um, I have a group coaching program. It's a six-week program called Trust Building Bootcamp. That one is a ton of fun and people really love to have somebody else to talk to. So that's another way that I work with people. I also have the podcast, Top Self, where that's a free resource for them that they can really get started on their own if they wanted to. So, um, and then, you know, in terms of who I work with, I really, when I started the podcast, I geared it towards women because that's what I understand, but I have male clients and I have a lot of people in the group that are male as well. So it's not just for women. Women aren't the only ones that have this problem. Hey, we get jealous too. This, that's for sure. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, uh, yeah with, I mean, it's, it's definitely something that I, I feel, uh, uh, definitely crosses the, the gender, but, uh, uh, boundaries and, and it's something we all experience. And it, it's a big, it's a big deal. And it can, it, it clearly can become debilitating like many, many things. And if it is, Shannon is your resource for that. And please reach out to her, go to topshelf.com, topself.com, sorry, not top shelf. That's a different website, uh, topself.com, um, and find, uh, Shannon there, uh, reach out to her, get involved with her group coaching or one-on-one -on -one coaching, and uh, check out the Top Self podcast. Uh, yours truly was on it, it, uh, it, it uh, recently. So enjoy that. And um, Shannon, thank you so, so much for being here. Um, I appreciate your time. Um, and it's been an honor. Thank you, Adam. I love everything that you're doing. Thank you so much for reaching out to people and helping them the way that you do. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Everybody else out there, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining me today on Flow Over Fear. If you are liking this show, please do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. That way you'll be first to know when I drop a new episode, including interviews or trainings or dad jokes. 
That's right, dad jokes. Add a little levity to your life. And if you liked this episode in particular, and you think somebody can get something from it, please share it with a friend. And that way we'll spread the message together. Thanks again for joining me today. We'll see you next time.